This revision video is designed for students studying GCSE English Literature with the exam board Edexcel exams from 2017. We're focusing on Paper 1, Section A, that's the Shakespeare. The play that we're going to be focusing on is Macbeth, and the theme for this particular video is the supernatural. So what you've got at the top of this slide is what your exam paper will look like when you open it. This is Section A, the Shakespeare. You are required to answer only questions on one text from this section. So if you've done Macbeth, please answer the question on Macbeth. Don't be tempted to go off and start answering questions on Much Ado if you haven't studied it. The exam board suggests that you should spend 55 minutes on this section and divide your time equally between Part A and Part B. Now, as you can see on the left hand side at the bottom here, the first part, um, question A, is extract based. You'll be given a small part of the text and you'll be asked to focus very closely on language and structure devices used by Shakespeare to convey a certain theme or perhaps focusing on the behaviour of a certain character. So you are being tested on your AO2 there, your analysis. Now part B is slightly different. What they want you to do here is demonstrate your wider knowledge of the play and that's why I've suggested you put a little bit more time into this one because you're not only having to recall quotations and make judgments about them using inference but also linking in the historical social context of Shakespeare's time, but also of um, kind of Dark Ages Scotland as well. Now, although this video is going to be focused around the theme of the supernatural, we can't guarantee that that's the wording that the exam board would use. They might ask you about the importance of the witches or use witchcraft, maybe the theme of evil in the play or the idea of the paranormal. So when I say the supernatural, it does also cover those three bullet points on the right hand side. These are the key scenes that I would recommend you look at for the supernatural. So this might be an opportunity. Pause the video. Can you remember what happens in each of these scenes? Um, so pause your video. I'll put the picture up in a minute to remind you and then we'll go th through each of these key scenes. So our first key scene that we're going to examine in more detail um, is Act 1, Scene 5, the first appearance of Lady Macbeth, where she reads the letter from her husband telling her about the witches, and she decides that she's going to uh, take charge of this situation, and she calls upon the spirits of darkness to unsex her here and create her as a more um, violent and more um, evil character. So. On the slides that follow, you can see that some of these quotations have got bits in red. Those, in my mind, are the important bits linked to the theme of the supernatural. They've each got their own bits of terminology that go with them, and I'll talk through them one at a time. So our very first line in that quite famous speech, Come you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts. You've got Lady Macbeth using an imperative here, which is the posh word for a command, showing that she feels that she is able to take control over these spirits. She is putting herself higher than them, therefore it conveys her power. But also, she uses what's called assonance here with mortal thoughts. And that, that's going to slow down the pace of that particular phrase. Now, mortal thoughts means um, thoughts of death. So it's going to emphasise that phrase. So she's calling on spirits, she's commanding spirits, that think about death. So she's in herself become quite witch-like in this scene. And don't forget the very opening thing that's talked about in this scene, they met me in the day of success. Macbeth is talking about the witches and then his wife starts to do kind of witch-like things. She refers to these spirits later on in her speech as you murdering ministers, wherever in your sightless substances you wait on nature's mischief. So murdering ministers, again, you've got some great use of alliteration here, which is going to slow the pace down of that phrase. Ministers being a type of priest, but this is murdering ministers. So rather than having, you know, good priests, these are evil priests. And wherever in your sightless substances, you've got some great use of sibilant, alliter uh, sibilant alliteration there. And that hissing sound is going to convey a kind of um, that hissing might suggest um, snakes, perhaps, or the idea of suspicion and evil. So the way that the language sounds when it is performed on stage, because remember, this is a play, it has an audience, not a reader, that sibilance is going to convey that kind of tension in this speech. When referring to the um, kind of the image of the murder, she talks about it being kind of covered. The deed is going to be covered up because a pole is a funeral cloth. 
It is going to pull thee in the dunnest smoke of hell, that my keen knife see not the wound it makes, nor heaven peep through the blanket of the dark. Now, dunnest, meaning darkest, is a little bit of exaggeration here, using superlative adjectives. So, when this deed is going to be uh, covered up, it's not going to be covered up a little bit. It's going to be covered with all the smoke of hell. And that juxtaposition, that mention of heaven and hell, of course, is giving us the idea of higher powers and the supernatural. But look at the juxtaposition of the word heaven and peep. Now, surely heaven is so powerful, it wouldn't have to be, you know, peeping through a blanket. Surely it could just sweep the curtain back and see what Lady Macbeth is doing. So what she's suggesting here is that the deed they're going to be do, the, the deed they are going to um, commit is going to be so dreadful that even the highest powers of heaven will be too afraid to pull back the blanket of the dark and look at what they are doing. So there's an idea of her wanting to shock here and to say the most extreme thing she can, commanding the supernatural forces to give herself power and status. So our next scene, Act 2, Scene 1, which is just after Banquo and Fleance have gone to bed uh, because the moon is down, and Macbeth prepares to go and murder Duncan. He has the very fam famous uh, dagger hallucination. Is this a dagger that I see before me, the handle towards my hand? So the key quotations we're going to examine here relating to the supernatural. I have thee not, and yet I see thee still. He uses direct address here, talking directly to this kind of um, uh, invisible dagger. Now, in some productions, there is an actual dagger on stage. In others, there is no dagger at all. And you could uh, do a little bit of discussion around uh, the dramatic form there to uh, discuss that further. But of course, there's repetition here as well. So there's a sense of him being in utter disbelief at what he is experiencing. I see thee still, and on thy blade and dudgeon, gouts of blood, which was not so before. Now, that could be some personification, the idea of the knife symbolising uh, the body of Duncan, perhaps, because, of course, he is a warlord king. He's just been in battle. So is this dagger that he sees before him Duncan himself? And are the gouts of blood foreshadowing the death of Duncan? Or is it simply um, the murder weapon? And therefore, that use of emotive language here um, with the word blood seems to suggest um, the supernatural linking to the idea of horror and violence. So a little bit of um, alternative interpretation there that you could discuss, which, of course, your examiner always wants to see. They don't want you to be a yes man. They don't want you to regurgitate knowledge. They want you to have an opinion as long as you can back it up. Now, this last one is quite complex because you have to know the, you have to understand the context of this character that is mentioned, Tarquin. Now, there's a very famous ancient story that Shakespeare wrote an epic poem about called The Rape of Lucretia. And Tarquin is the rapist in this story. So when Macbeth says, thus with his stealthy pace, with Tarquin's ravishing strides towards his design moves like a ghost, he's comparing himself to the, this attacker from this famous story, which Shakespeare's audience would have been aware of. He's comparing himself to this person who attacks another in their bedchamber. But he's conveying the same idea of violence. But whereas Tarquin used these ravishing strides, so he was proudly going to attack this woman, he instead is going to be moving like a ghost because, of course, what he's about to do is regicide and um, has to be kept completely secret. So there is a simile being used there. So Act 3, Scene 4, probably one of the best scenes in the whole play, is where Banquo's ghost appears at the banquet. Um, most of these, um, yep, in fact, all of these quotations are from Macbeth. Obviously, you can look at um, some of the things that um, Lady Macbeth says, and there's always a bit of a question in my mind of can she see the ghost as well? Or even is the ghost on stage? Is it all completely a fabrication of Macbeth's um, insecurity and Macbeth's guilt? Or is the ghost really there? He says, if charnel houses and our graves must send those we bury back again, our monuments shall be the moors of kites. So what he's saying here is charnel houses being kind of like a crypt under a church and graves sending something. That's personification. So these um, kind of these effigies of death are going to be pushing the dead back again. So there's a sense of disturbance in the natural order here. And also you've got some alliteration, plosive alliteration of we bury back. So again, he emphasizes those words. The times have been that when the brains were out, the man would die and there an end. But now they rise again with 20 mortal murders on their crowns. He uses lots of short phrases there, lots of commas, lots of pauses to show his disbelief. But also a statistic, 
here using the number 20 to try and emphasize well even if you hit them 20 times they're still coming back what's going on you know he's in this disbelief and the emphasis again using the alliteration of mortal murders alliteration always makes you slow down okay so it's got it, may, it really wants you to take notice of those words i drink to the general joy of the whole table and to our dear friend Banquo, whom we miss, would he were here. Now, the whole table, exaggeration. Macbeth is trying to mask the fact that he's going through a bit of a crisis here by flattering everybody. So, in turn, this is his reaction to the supernatural, is to go a bit too over-the-top normal. But, of course, there's some absolutely beautifully crafted dramatic irony, because, of course, what happens directly after this line is the ghost reappears. Our dear friend Banquo, whom we miss, would he were here, enter ghost. So, brilliantly crafted dramatic irony there. So I do think in some ways the supernatural in this scene, although it's highly dramatic and highly entertaining, I do think it's a little bit tongue in cheek in places as well. Because don't forget, this is a play. It's supposed to be performed on stage. And finally, you've got Act 4, Scene 1, which is the second set of prophecies. Um, Macbeth has decided he's going to visit them again because he wants to know what's, what's still in store for him. So great quote here, double, double, toil and trouble, fire, burn and cauldron, bubble. Looking at the idea of form here, you've got rhyming verse, which Shakespeare's audience would have considered to be spectral and a, little, and a little bit suspect. I think the idea was if you were so crafty with language that you could make it rhyme, what else were you crafty with? Maybe there was something a bit supernatural about you. He says, I will be satisfied. Deny me this and an eternal curse fall on you. He uses exaggeration here and he threatens the witches. So this gives a sense of he now feels more powerful than the supernatural in the same way that Lady Macbeth did in Act 1, Scene 5. But of course, he kind of he, he can cope with being more powerful than the supernatural, whereas she can't. And this exaggeration of an eternal curse fall on you um, echoes through this statement. And they go, yeah, OK, have a look at this. Have a look at this line of kings that's about to take over from you. And Macbeth's reaction. Why do you show me this? A fourth? start eyes what will the line stretch out into the crack of doom another yet a seventh so this is where he's seeing um banquo's um issue the line of seven kings and so the techniques that are being used here again this exaggeration stretch out into the crack of doom and so it's very um it uses hyperbole here it's very very over the top and of course you've got loads of rhetorical questions here to show his disbelief now remember in um, part b of this question you have to reference context it's only worth a quarter of your marks, um, so five out of the 20 that you get for this question. But they're, they're marks worth having and they're very easy to integrate into your discussion. So in terms of the supernatural, obviously you've got to mention witchcraft. James I um, wrote a book about how terrible witches were and he was massively paranoid. So you've got to talk about the fact that James I was big against witches and Shakespeare wrote this play to appease James I. That's why it's got Banquo in it, who is a direct ancestor of James I. You've got to remember that Shakespeare's audience believed in the devil. They believed that the devil's agents could control people and that people could um, be possessed also and have be under the influence of evil. Now, not getting into a theological discussion, I think the, the nature of evil still exists in our world. But I think we kind of put it down to human nature rather than kind of the agents of hell. But Shakespeare's audience very much believed in the idea that there was this little man, that there was this little man with a pitchfork and horns who made people do bad things. And that to be a good person was to trust in God and to be a bad person was to not trust in God and to kind of follow your kind of more beastly instincts towards violence and chaos. So what I'm going to give you on this slide is a fairly basic essay plan for uh, 1B. So this is the second part of the question where you have to explore lots of scenes and bring in your contextual knowledge. I do think part A of this question is a lot easier because you've got the text in front of you and essentially it is feature spotting with an, with an understanding of effects focused on the question. This one is a bit more complicated. So the wording of the question that they've given us in the sample assessment material is this explain the importance of theme elsewhere in the play. Now, I've given you four options on this essay plan. You will not talk about all four of them. You will only be speaking about three of them because there's a good chance one of them is going to appear in part A. So let's take a look at these scenes that we've just looked at some quotations for and what we can discuss in terms of the importance of the supernatural. So in 1.5, that's Lady Macbeth, um, come new spirits. 
the supernatural is being used as a weapon. So the importance of the supernatural is this idea of it being a weapon used to shock. And of course, you can link um, contextually here, you can link contextually to the idea of people being possessed by the devil, which is essentially what Lady Macbeth is asking them to do. She says, come you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts and fill me up from the crown to the toe, top full of direst cruelty. She wants to be possessed and she wants to use that to shock. In Acts 2, scene 1, the, is this a dagger I shall see before me? Um, the supernatural is used to represent the treacherous deed Macbeth is about to commit. So again, linking the supernatural to the idea of violence here. So that um, scary dagger appears as a murder weapon. And there you're getting a contextual link to the idea of evil, that supernatural is inherently linked to evil deeds, such as murder. In one production of Macbeth that I've seen, the witches, um, supposedly invisible to Macbeth, actually carry the dagger towards um, towards Duncan's bedchamber. So you could argue that contextually here, the um, supernatural is telling Macbeth to do the deed. Um, 3.4, which is the banquet scene, um, the supernatural is used to convey guilt. Um, you could argue from a modern audience's point of view, Macbeth is going through a psychosis and he's hallucinating this ghost of his dear friend who he has just had murdered. Um, you could link in the idea of um, possession, that people could be possessed by the devil, because, of course, this ha scene happens very publicly in Macbeth's kingdom. All of his guests are there, his wife is there, and they all think he's gone completely mad. So could there be an idea that the rest of Macbeth's um, guests consider him to have been possessed by the devil because he talks about things that aren't actually there? So there is a little contextual link you could make there. But, of course, Shakespeare's audience believed in ghosts and possibly vengeful ghosts as well, which of course um, Banquo appears as um, in this particular scene. And finally, if you look at the second appearance and the final appearance of the witches, um, the supernatural is used to show how fearless Macbeth has become, because in this scene he commands them, he curses them, and says, you're going to do this for me, you're going to show me this. So everybody fears the supernatural, Surely you're going to fear the man who doesn't fear the supernatural and is able to control the supernatural. Macbeth becomes a bit witch-like in this scene. Don't be mistaken. Yes, witches are stereotypically women, but you could be burned as a witch for, if you were a man as well in this particular time. So you can link in the idea of their fear of witchcraft here. I hope you found this revision video useful. As much as you can, reread your scenes, re-watch adaptations, and good luck in your exams.